All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Global Education, our global encounters in partnership with our very good friends at the Canadian Commission for UNESCO and Media Smarts as we talk about journalism, fake news, and disinformation as a part of Global Media and Information Literacy Week uh, run through UNESCO. It's, uh, well, I think they're marking their 10th year this year of Global Media Information Literacy Week. It started in 2011 in Morocco. There was a meeting and they, they came up with this idea, but this was long before the rise of disinformation in terms of political polarization, um, in terms of the COVID pandemic and what we've seen about disinformation around that. Um, so in this current like ecosystem of complex and contradictory messages and uh, meanings and, and truths and, and sort of, wonderful complex issues that arise from those those topics it's hard to think of how public good is being advanced by media like it feels sometimes though we're just breeding threats and division but in the face of this that's why it's so important to have a media and information literacy week we need to equip ourselves with the skills to understand what's at stake how to navigate it and how to benefit from all the amazing opportunities that do come from communication technologies. I mean, there's this, right? We're here at this platform where we have schools joining from, well, I'll show you our list in a second, but we have schools joining from Russia and Bermuda and Trinidad and Argentina and Canada and the US. And we have students that are homeschooling and students that are traditionally schooling. And this is, there is amazing potential. But how do we wade or weed ourselves and navigate ourselves through all of the, the, the misinformation that's out there? And so uh, I think this week is of great importance. And I know that the Canadian Commission for UNESCO does as well. Now, uh, I will introduce Isabel, maybe. Why don't I do that now? Oh, first, ah, first, the land acknowledgement. So we are, I am joining you from Treaty 6 land. And in we do land acknowledgements. There's been a lot in the media in Canada around the Truth and Reconciliation Com uh, Commission in the last few years. And what it means to really bring communities together. And what it means to reflect on our pasts. And media is a part of that. It's a part of the messaging. It's a part of who we are and how we spread our values and our culture. And so as a part of my reconciliation process, I want to acknowledge that I'm joining you on Treaty 6 land. And it's a traditional meeting grounds and traveling route, the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Denny, Nakota Sioux. And I want to acknowledge all the French nations and Métis and Inuit who have marked these footsteps of these lands for centuries. And we must do more than just talk about reconciliation. We need to think about it in terms of our daily lives. You know, it's not just about doing a land acknowledgement, it's about how are we embedding this in our workplaces, our schools, our homes, so that we're establishing and maintaining respectful relationships. And, and a part of that is, um, you know, bringing Indigenous values and ways of knowing and storytelling into our schools and, and using that to foster respect and foster reconciliation. So I wanted to do that first before we got started. And I'm sure that, that others stay here joining you today would also like to do um, land acknowledgements as well. But if you're joining us from one of our remote sites from Russia or from Argentina who are not going through a process of reconciliation, I think it's important to understand why this is important to Canadians and why it's a process that we really need to invest in and, and really dispel, just like with media, dispel some myths that are in our communities and talk about how do we build instead of um, distancing ourselves from the people around us. So anyways, Isabel, wonderful to have you joining us this morning from CC UNESCO. I'd okay. love to invite you to introduce the Canadian Commission and, and your goals for our session today. Uh, thanks, Sarah. So I'm joining you from Ottawa, um, which is unceded Algonquin territory, and it is cold and rainy here. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you for that beautiful land acknowledgement, Sarah. And I think it's, it's from a national and global perspective. I think it's important for us to know um, how our, our relationship to where we live and the land and, um, and in particular in the Canadian context, First Nation, Métis and Inuit um, 
who have lived. And I think that inf influences our education systems, because I think the more that we know, the more we're looking at the future of education, that um, traditional indigenous ways of learning and knowing can be, um, you know, uh, very beneficial for all our students, as particular some of you will be following COP26 or looking at climate change and what we can do to take action. But today I'm very excited to be here on Monday. It is uh, the first official day for the Global Media and Information Literacy Week uh, launched by UNESCO. And it coincides with our uh, very national, our great national partner, Media Smarts, that has their Media Literacy Week. And um, I think during the pandemic, uh, we've been bombarded by news. And I think it's critically important today to um, unpackage that and make sure that we are aware of what we're <laughs> receiving as news because there's actually been an increase in misinformation, disinformation and fake news. And that's why I'm so excited to hear about all the tools that Media Smarts has to offer for teachers and classrooms and students like you. Like they're break their fairy, they have amazing stuff on their website. Uh, I won't tell it, <laughs> Matthew will tell you a lot more about that, but I think it's just so important. So thank you for all the classrooms and the teachers and the students here to take the opportunity to pause and reflect. Um, because if you're a student, there is no way that you're not reading, gathering, information um, and digesting and sharing it back in the classroom the same thing for teachers so it's so important to know how to assess uh, um, assess what we read what we gather um, and then how do we make sure that it's legitimate and that we're not causing harm to our communities by also um, spreading fake news so thank you so much miigwetch all right i'm gonna quickly share my screen where it shows oops sorry chat where it shows all the schools that are joining us today. So we have some of our friends from Newfoundland and we have our school in Edmonton, Austin O'Brien High School. Welcome to you. I know you're both joining later online or maybe you're already online with the bell schedule going on. Uh, we also have our friends oh, loading in the background, isn't it? There we go. Um, from Fulford Academy who are here in the, class, in the classroom with us and Kelowna Secondary. We have the Global School in Argentina, our friends at Pennington in New Jersey. Uh, we have Reeds in Westbridge High School in Westbridge and then Bermuda Public Schools in Hamilton. Oh, and I missed our friends from Queens Royal College in Trinidad. So I'll add them to this list too. And then our friends in Indonesia and Costa Rica as well. And of course, our friends from Russia who will be joining us momentarily. Always wonderful to have you here. Thanks so much. Such a great sort of combination of East and West and North and South. That's so exciting for conversations about wow, this is what's happening in Canada. And I mean, I think we've all seen what's happening in the US in terms of fake news and disinformation. And I wonder what it's like in these other communities as well. So Matthew, I think you're gonna have a lot of questions and conversation, and I would love to just throw over to you to get started. Perfect, thank you so much, uh, Sarah. And thank you, Isabel. Let me just share my screen so we can get started. Um, and, you know, uh, Media Literacy Week has been going on now for more than a decade, I think almost 15 years, and it's been amazing in that time to see it spread as an event um, around the world. We now have, have sister uh, organizations leading Media Literacy Week in places like the United States and Australia and various European countries, and of course, um, Media Information Literacy Week. Uh, joining that as well. So it's been amazing to see media literacy, digital media literacy, becoming uh, a more important part of the public conversation. And in that same time, we've also, of course, seen a tremendous change in how we consume and use media. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we now have uh, different we have different needs as media literacy educators and as media users and consumers. A lot of the uh, skills that were traditionally part of media literacy are still tremendously important, but we now have to evaluate first when we're looking at a source of information before we do that traditional close reading, we now have to really judge whether or not a source is worth our attention at all. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be looking at four easy ways to tell if something 
is true online to find to tell whether or not a source is worth paying attention to. So let's start out with some examples. So take a second, you don't have to answer, but just within your own head, take a look at these two pictures and think for yourself, which of these pictures do you think is real? Okay, you've decided. So this one, this picture is real. This is called a peacock spider. And every bit of this is real. Every one of those colors, those vi beautiful, vibrant colors is real. The previous picture, um, the picture of the uh, leopard was real, but the blue eyes were added digitally. Now I want you to take a look at these two news sources, the Buffalo News and the Buffalo Chronicle. Which of these news sources is real? Take a quick look, see if you can tell, see if there are any hints. And here's the answer. The Buffalo News is real. It's an actual, it's not a print newspaper, but it is an actual news site, does real news gathering in Buffalo, New York, United States. Um, the Buffalo Chronicle, well-known source of disinformation. Finally, which of these websites is real? The Shed Restaurant in Dulwich or the Mike the Headless Chicken Festival in Colorado? Here we go. Mike the Headless Chicken is real. Um, it is an actual festival. It, I think they had to skip a year because of the pandemic, but I think they did have one again this year. It's an actual festival that happens every year uh, to commemorate a chicken who lived for a surprisingly long time without a head. Uh, the Shed Restaurant at Dulwich is a restaurant that does not exist. The website is real. Someone set up uh, reviews for his own for a restaurant supposedly held in Shed. Um, and managed to get it briefly the top rated restaurant in the United Kingdom. So what was the point of showing you this? First of all, reflect for a second how many got all three right. Maybe you got one right, maybe you got two, maybe you got all three. A lot of it was from chance. The fact is, there's no easy way to spot misinformation online. It's as easy to make a fake website as a real one and computer graphics technology that just a few years ago was limited to big budget Hollywood movies is now available on free smartphone apps. Because everything on the internet is connected, it's also easy for misinformation to reach lots of people. Sometimes people share misinformation by accident, either because they really think something is true but it isn't, or because they don't think other people will take it seriously. So they may know that what they're sharing is untrue, but the people who see it don't realize it's parody or satire. Most of us have probably shared something we thought was real without checking. The fact is, we're more likely to share things we feel strongly about, especially things that we hope are true. But a lot of the misinformation that's online isn't trying to get us to believe a particular thing. It's actually designed to make us doubt whether anything is true. That's why even seemingly harmless examples of misinformation still matter. Online misinformation hasn't just made us easier to fool, it's made us more cynical as well, less likely to believe that anything is true. Because if we can't tell what's true, it feels safer to assume that everything is fake. But critical thinking isn't about doubting everything. It's about learning how to find out what is true, because only truth can break the fake. In this workshop, we're going to look at four steps you can take to find out if something is true or not. Using fact-checking tools, finding the original source, verifying the source, and checking what you've seen against other sources that you know are reliable. Once you've learned these, none will take you more than two minutes to do. And as you'll see, some will take just 10 seconds. Just one of these will usually get you the answer that you need but it's good to know how to do all four. I'm gonna show you a few different ways to do each one, and then you'll get a chance to try it out. 
Sometimes a single search can break the fake if a professional fact checker has already done the work for you. Thanks to computers, as we've seen, it's easy to make fake pictures. And a lot of times people will share them without knowing that they're fake. Take these two photos of the pyramids shared by two popular Twitter accounts, Piclogy and History Lovers Club. They both look pretty real, don't they? Or do they both look fake? Both accounts have shared plenty of fake and misleading photos. Now we could do the detective work ourselves and I'll show you how to do that in a minute, but it's easier to let somebody else do it. Let's start with the grandparent of all fact-checking sites, Snopes.com. They've been around since the early days of the internet and they fact-check all kinds of things. When we go to this site and search for Zeppelin over pyramid, we can see they've already confirmed that this photo is for real. And that's important to understand. Fact checkers don't just debunk things. They also establish when things that might not be true are. When we search Snopes for pyramid clouds, we found they've also checked this photo out and found that it's fake. There are also fact checkers that specialize in different topics like health or politics or news in different countries. Another way you can see if someone's debunked a false or misleading news story is to do a search for the topic of the story and add the words fake or hoax to your search. So one of the things that we often see going around every time there's a big storm is a picture of what appears to be a shark swimming in a subway station. If we wanted to find out if that was not true or whether it was true or not, we could type shark in subway station hoax and that'll tell us whether people are claiming that it's a hoax. Now this can be a bit risky because anyone can say that something is a hoax. So you need to make sure that the people debunking it are reliable. To be sure a fact checker is reliable, you want to see if they've signed on to the International Fact Checking Network's Code of Principles. To make it easier, We've made a custom search engine that you can use at this address to search all of these. So bit.ly, bit.ly is what's called a link shortener. It lets you make long web addresses into short ones. And so if you go to bit.ly forward slash fact dash search, you can search all of these. And in fact, we're up to about 15, I think, search uh, fact checkers. You can search them all at once and nothing else. And that will let you, as we'll see, that lets you search fact checkers that have a different focus and that may cover or not cover different stories. So here's an exercise that will show you just how quickly you can find out if something is true or not. This video of Toronto Raptors fans cheering when Golden State Warriors player Kevin Durant got injured was seen and shared more than a million times on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. You can see the original post at bit.ly forward slash Durant cheer. So just type that in, it'll take you to the original post. And from there, take a few minutes. We're just gonna take a minute or two to find out if it's true using one of the skills we've just learned. So take a couple of minutes to do that. Once you think you have an answer, type it into the chat box along with how you found out the answer. So is this real or not? And how did you find out? Take, we'll take just about two minutes to do that.
Hi, Trina. I don't think it's that there's no sound. I think that Matthew is giving us some time to watch the video on our own because sharing video um, across multiple international sites um, can be a little tricky. But maybe, Matthew, could you describe what they would see if they can't access the video themselves? Well, okay. So some people may not be able to access it. I'm going to show talk about it in just a minute. I'm going to oh. go through okay, uh, <laughs> what you would see. Um, so that's fine. But if anyone has was able to access um, the should be I just checked it yesterday. So it should be okay. But I know that in some countries, it may not be available. Um, I'll show you in a moment. But if anyone was able to do this exercise, if anyone was able to look it up, and use any of the techniques that we just talked about to practice it. Um, so I'll put it uh, then we can, we'll talk about that. So I'm going to put in the fact checking search link into the chat box. It's bit.ly fact search. And that's the, I also put in the link to the original story if you want to check that out. Now you see why I muted so you wouldn't have to hear my cat. All right, so we have one person saying it's uh, it's fake. So uh, another one says true was uh, injured Achilles, presume Achilles tendon in game five against the Raptors. So we've established that they were okay. One says it's fake. He was playing for the Warriors. All right. So uh, that's true. He was playing for the Warriors. He was injured. So uh, we don't necessarily know. We've had got a couple of people saying it's fake. One person says it's fake, it was digitally manipulated. So the question here is how do we know? And we've seen from those examples at the very beginning that uh, sometimes you can't, most of the time you can't tell just by looking at something, whether it's true or fake. And you can't necessarily go with your gut feeling, you can't go with your instincts. Um, and a lot of the time, when you're looking for evidence that something is fake, when you're just looking at it really closely, you're gonna see evidence whether it's there or not. And in fact, of course, we don't know generally have the time to uh, do this kind of close examination of most sources. So the quickest route here is, okay, we've got, yeah, Snopes said so. Here's what we're going to see if we do a search. So we can get this answer either by doing a search with the word hoax or fake added, um, <laughs> or by using our custom fact search, or you can go directly to uh, Snopes if you wanted to. But if you do use the custom fact checker search, you'll see quite a few different sources. Um, either one leads us to fact check AFP, where we can see the videos of fake. The original is actually from a soccer game in 2016, and footage of the basketball game on the screen has been edited in. But when Early on, I think this is no longer true, but when the story first came out, Snopes didn't have anything on this story. Uh, so that's one reason why it's good to search multiple fact checkers. And it also shows you that just because a fact checker hasn't debunked something doesn't mean that it's true. It means they may just not have gotten around to it. And if you live outside of the United States, that can be significant because uh, it means that they, Snopes, for instance, doesn't cover necessarily that many stories outside of the United States. If nobody else has fact-checked a story for you, so if you've done this first step and you don't get an answer one way or the other, we move to our next step, which is find the original source. Because it's so easy to copy and share things online, it's important to find out where something originally came from before you decide whether or not to trust it. Someone might have shared it with you on social media, Media, or a news story might be based on someone else's story. So one easy way to find the original source is to use a search engine. We might wonder if this post that seems to show a US Senator displaying a picture of Aquaman to Congress is real. As we already saw, pictures are easy to fake and pictures where someone is holding a sign are especially easy. 
because you just have to change what's on the sign. We can do a search for his name for Aquaman and C-SPAN, which is where the picture supposedly came from, open this link to C-SPAN in a new tab, and we see that this actually does come from C-SPAN's footage of the US Congress. So this story is true. This really did happen. Exactly why he was talking about Aquaman, I don't know. Um, whether the story is serious or not, I don't know, but the story is true. Another way to find out if a photo like this one of astronomer Carl Sagan is real is to do a reverse image search. Start by clicking on the image, then right click and select copy image location. Now, how you do that is slightly different on different platforms, but basically every browser uh, lets you copy the image location, the web address of where the picture is hosted. So this is what it looks like um, in Firefox. Next, we go to tineye.com, which is a reverse image search engine, and paste in the address. One of the reasons why I like tineye in particular, because there are a number of different reverse image searches, is it lets you sort in different ways. So it can let you sort by uh, what changed, and it also lets you sort by date. So in this case, if we sort the results to show the oldest version of the picture first, we can see right away there's a different version of the photo. Because the two are exactly the same, except for what's on the sign, it's most likely the older one is the original. And indeed, it was. So this is Carl Sagan holding the inscription that was placed on the Voyager probe um, in case it was found by aliens. And someone later changed the sign to say something else. Even if something you see is real, though, it may not be what the source that shared it says they are. This photo, for instance, is not actually Charlie Chaplin, but an actress named Tell Me Talia. That's why you need to follow links in a story until you get to where information actually came from. So here are two examples of links in this story. The actual story doesn't necessarily matter uh, how, whether or not we trust the story, because we can follow these links back to the original information. Now, that's especially important on social networks, where we usually pay more attention to who shared something with us instead of where it originally came from. If there aren't links in a story, we look for phrases like the New York Times reported or the word source at the top or bottom of a story to find out where it originally came from. Here again, we may see this story on Huffington Post, but it's actually a story from Reuters, the wire agency. So if something presents you with facts or statistics, but doesn't tell you where they came from, there's no way to know if you can trust them. For instance, this story from Bleacher Report claims that breakdancing and skateboarding are going to become official Olympic events. When we scroll, scroll down a bit, we see it's based on earlier stories from Reuters and the Associated Press. And so we know that we can trust them. To make sure Bleacher Report is giving us an accurate picture of what those sources reported, we can follow the links, we right click to open them in new tabs, and we see that this story is true. Make sure, though, that the story really is from that source. Lots of websites, including many reliable ones, like the Reuters News Service, carry sponsored content, paid links to stories on other sites. So the main story you see here is a Reuters story, but everything at the top and everything down the right are links that people have paid them to run. They're ads for other stories. If there aren't links in a story, you can do a search for the topic plus the sources that are given like this. So if we see it being sourced to Reuters, we can type breakdancing Olympics Reuters, and that will give us the information that we need. We can also use a reverse image search to see if a photo really is what it seems to be. According to this tweet, this photo shows a terrible mess left behind after an environmentalist protest, but Following the steps we learned a few minutes ago shows the picture is actually from a concert in 2014. Now it's your turn. Did explorers really find hundreds of animals that were thought to be extinct at a place called the lost city of the monkey god? Take a couple of minutes to find the original source of this story 
and see if it's true or not. So thank you, Sarah, for putting uh, the URL in. So take a look at the link, try to follow it back to the original source and see whether or not this story is true. Maybe once you have a, a guess, you can write it in the chat so we can see. And if you're on YouTube, you can write it in the chat there. We have some, one of our um, colleagues here at the CGE is online looking at your comments and your thoughts. So you can still participate and get your vote in. My, Of course, I want to know what your cat thinks. All right, I've had a chance to scroll through. So has anyone else had a chance? Are they any, anyone willing to put forward their thoughts on whether or not this is fake? So we're hearing one person, pretty, people are saying it's true. So remember, don't just say whether it's true or false, but tell us how you found out. So what evidence led you to think? Or what steps did you take to find out whether it was true or false? Okay. Someone's saying it was in National Geographic, so maybe you read it elsewhere. That's useful, but that's not always going to be the case. National Geographic, some people may already know about this story. You may have seen it. Maybe it happened. Who knows? Uh, we may have some people uh, who've even got direct knowledge. But again, we can't rely on that. There's so many different pieces of information, especially when it comes to things like science uh, and medicine most of us aren't going to have direct knowledge. So we need to find a way of finding out whether something is coming from a reliable source. Okay, some people don't think it's real. Again, we're trying to figure out how do we know? So what steps are we taking? So in this case, uh, we might have had a reason to doubt because it's coming from a source that we've never heard of. Uh, someone's saying the link on the post went to a different news page, which went to conservation.org, which seems reliable. Okay, so we'll come back in a few minutes to the question of whether being a .org means something is reliable. Um, let's see what we find. So most of you did say that the story was true, but let's look at how we found out. So even though you may have no reason to think Nexus News Feed is a very reliable source, when we follow the link, we can see that this story actually came from The Independent, a well-known British newspaper. So here's the original source that it leads us to, Nexus Newsfeed, but it's got a link to The Independent. When we follow that link, we see the story is actually there. So it didn't matter that Nexus Newsfeed was not necessarily a reliable source or a source that we didn't know if it was reliable or not, because it's not really a story from Nexus Newsfeed. It's a story from The Independent. That's why it's so important to follow the links, follow the story back to the original source. But what if we don't know whether the independent is a reliable source? What if you've never heard of it before? And how do we know that this is the real website anyway? So I'll answer those questions looking at the third step, verify the source. Whether you're looking at a website, a photo or video or a news story, what really matters is whether or not the people who originally created it are trustworthy. You can't always confirm that something is false, but 
If a source isn't reliable, you have no reason to believe it. This is the only time when it matters what order you do the steps in. Reliable sources do sometimes share things that turn out not to be true, and unreliable sources sometimes share things that are true. That's why you shouldn't bother verifying a source until you know for sure it's where the information originally came from. So don't do this step until you've done find the source. Don't do this step, step until you're sure you know the original source of the information. Once we know we found the original source, we need to ask three questions. First, does this source really exist? We saw earlier how easy it is to make fake pictures online, and it's just as easy to make a fake website or a fake social me media profile. Second, are they who they say they are? It's also easy to impersonate people online and to create imposter sites or social network accounts. Finally, are they reliable? Anybody can claim to be an expert online, so you need to make sure there are good reasons to think someone is a reliable source. These days, it's easy to make websites that look just as slick and professional as anything that's out there. In fact, some trustworthy sources may look less professional than fake sites because they haven't put time or money into updating their website. So this, for instance, is the actual Honest to Gosh website of the Yale School of Art. Uh, it looks like it hasn't been updated. The design hasn't been updated since about 1990. Um, so often we do find that fake sites look better. They look more professional than real sites, than reliable sites. So we can't take that as, um, we can't take that as evidence. People who spread misinformation on purpose often invent local newspapers or TV news stations. This kind of source seems trustworthy, but most of us aren't likely to have heard of a paper or TV station in a different city or country, so you might not know whether or not the Courier Mail was a real newspaper. It, it is, but if you didn't come from, um, I believe, Sydney, Australia, you probably wouldn't know. Here are two websites that claim to be from Sherbrooke, Quebec, The Times and The Record. Which one is real? Both of them have an About Us or Contact Us page with a street and email address and the names of people who work there. But then all of that is easy to fake. Instead, let's go to Wikipedia and see if there's an article there about the Sherbrooke Record. You don't have to go directly to Wikipedia to search. You can also just put what you're looking for in the search box of any search engine and add Wikipedia. From the Wikipedia article, we can see that the record has been around for more than a century, and there's no reason to think it isn't a reliable source. How about the Times? There isn't an article about it in Wikipedia, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not real. Wikipedia is written by volunteers, so a lot of things don't have entries. That's particularly true, again, if you live outside the United States or if you're using Wikipedia in a language other than English. There are a lot fewer articles, so it's entirely possible that this could be real and not have a Wikipedia article. Instead, we can do a search on Google. The only results we find are the website itself, its Twitter account, and articles pointing out that it's a fake. So now we know it's not a reliable source. It's easy to pretend to be someone else online. So once you know the source really exists, you need to find out if what you're looking at really came from them. Did Toronto police really put out a warning about a man in a Spider-Man costume webbing, webbing streetcar lines? Some social networks, like Twitter and Instagram, verify users by putting a blue check mark next to their name. Now, it's important to understand, this does not mean they're necessarily a reliable source, but it does mean that they are who they say they are. That's all that it means, that they have been confirmed as who they claim to be. In this case, it means this is a real Toronto police account, which means this story is true. It's a bit harder to make sure you're on the right website. People have made fake versions of real news websites like The Guardian and the CBC that look almost exactly like the real thing. These are both fake versions of these websites you're seeing right now. But there are things that are harder to fake. 
Now, a web address by itself does not tell you if a site is reliable. For instance, sites with .org addresses aren't necessarily more trustworthy. Anyone can register a .org address. I registered the web address for househippofoundation.org, and it was no more difficult than if it had been househippofoundation.com or .ca. But the web address can tell you if you're on an organization's real website. If you're satisfied a source is real and is who they say they are, you have to find out whether they're trustworthy. For sources of general information like newspapers, that means asking if they have a process for making sure they're giving you good information and a good track record of doing it. This becomes important when you're looking at sources that aren't fake, but that may give you only part of the story or may not have high standards in making sure that what they post is accurate. Unreliable sources sometimes do share things that are true. And as you can see here, even reliable sources can make mistakes. But in general, if you see a story from a source you know is reliable, you can assume it's probably true. Let's look at another pair of newspapers, the Washington Times and the Washington Post. Now, these are both real newspapers, and neither one is entirely unreliable, but one is a lot more reliable than the other. There are signs you can look for to decide how reliable a news source is. How often do they make mistakes? If they do make mistakes, do they admit them and publish corrections? Are they willing to publish things that their owners or their readers wouldn't agree with? If we look up the Washington Post on Wikipedia, we see it's been around since 1877 and has won 47 Pulitzer Prizes for its journalism. It's not perfect. They have published a few stories that turned out to be inaccurate, which they retracted and corrected publicly. But overall, it has a good track record. The Washington Times has, has also been around for a while, since 1982, but their track record isn't as good. Most of the Wikipedia article is about times they've spread misinformation about everything from the ozone layer to secondhand smoke. Now that doesn't mean the Times is an entirely unreliable source or that the Post never makes mistakes, but it does mean that most of the time you'll do a lot better trusting the Post. For more specialized sources, you wanna ask whether they're experts or authorities on that topic. Now being an expert is more than just being a doctor a scientist or a professor, you have to make sure they're an expert in the right field. A cardiologist would be an expert in treating your heart, but not on vaccines. Some sources, like certain professional groups or government agencies, are recognized authorities on particular topics. What they say carries more weight than any single expert in the field, and a lot more than a person or group who isn't an authority. How do you know who's an authority? Well, remember, anyone can call themselves a university, even if they don't offer certifications or diplomas. And anyone can call themselves an institute on the internet. This news story on how to get cheaper flights is based on a survey by an organization called Skyscanner. The, adv the advice in it, including the tip to book through a travel website instead of directly from an airline, comes from Alex Astania, one of their travel industry experts. Now, a search for Skyscanner shows us that they are a travel website, while a search for Astaniev's name shows he's actually their product manager. Remember, a LinkedIn page, like any other social network account, is easy to fake, so you'll want at least one more piece of evidence. We can look up Alex Astaniev and find a little more information about him. Now, we know that Skyscanner is not an authority. And in fact, they have good reason to make, want us to believe a particular thing, and that Astania is not an expert. Now, you give it a try. Take a look at two similar looking groups, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Pediatricians. Both of these claim to represent American pediatricians. Which one should we trust more? So the two websites are aap.org and acponline.org. But keep in mind that you don't want to just take their word for it. You want to look for other information that tells you whether or not they're authorities and whether they're trustworthy. So take a couple minutes to do that.
This one may have been a little trickier than the early earlier uh, exercises. So I'm going to go on. So which one is re more reliable and which one is less reliable? Well, they both claim to represent American pediatricians, and both of them have professional-looking websites that provide lots of general information. And if you go to their About Me pages, they'll both claim to represent American pediatricians. But if we do a search for the American Academy of Pediatrics and scroll past the result for their own website, we can see they have 64,000 doctors as members. A search for the ACP shows they have just 500 members and therefore a much weaker claim to be an authority on children's health. So just in terms of whether or not they are a legitimate authority, they obviously represent a lot fewer pediatricians in the United States. Looking more closely shows us the ACP is not just unreliable because it's not an authority, like Skyscanner, it also has a strong bias. The whole reason its members split from the AAP was because they were opposed to letting gay and lesbian parents adopt children. But it's important not to mix up authority and bias. Someone who is actually an expert on something will probably have stronger opinions about it than someone who isn't. But they'll be better informed opinions too. So. The AAP does have strong positions on things. The difference is the AAP's opinions, the opinions of the American Academy of Pediatrics, which are on everything from car seats to when the school day should start, are based on the expertise of their members. Whereas the American College of Pediatricians base their belief or base their positions on their beliefs about sexuality. Our last step, check others sources may sometimes be the last one you do, but it could also be the first. It's a quick way of sifting out bias and finding out whether something like a news story is for real. Did this politician really do a Facebook Live video with a cat face filter on? If we do a search for Pakistani politician cat filter and switch to the news tab, we see the story was covered by many different news outlets, from Global News in Canada to the BBC. In this step, we're not worried about the reliability of a single source. We're looking for a consensus among mostly reliable sources that something actually happened. News tab is better than the main search for that because it's more curated. So if you've never seen, looked at the news tab on a search engine like Google or DuckDuckGo, it's really useful for that. While not every source that's included is perfectly reliable, they're all news outlets that really exist. This step is also important for getting context, making sure you get the whole story. Remember, all sources make mistakes sometimes, but reliable ones correct them. Consulting other sources can help you find out if the first place you saw something might have been leaving something out. This is a good way of dealing with possible bias in any one source. You can also find this, use this step to find out whether something fits with what most of the experts on that topic agree what's called the consensus view. In fields like medicine, science, and history, consensus has been built up over time with each new piece of evidence tilting the scales in its favor. Something that goes against the consensus may turn out to be right, but it needs more and better evidence to outweigh the consensus. While it's generally good to give both sides of a story, including views that experts agree aren't right, can actually spread misinformation. An article in the pyramids, for example, doesn't have to mention that some people think they were built by aliens. News outlets and Wikipedia aren't always the best place to look for consensus on health and science, because the people writing the articles often aren't experts. For those topics, you want to turn to sources that you know are authorities. Here's another video, this time claiming that the North Pole is moving. We've made a custom search bit.ly bit forward slash science dash search that looks just at sources whose writers are experts in the fields that they write about. A quick search for North Pole moving on this search engine tells us while not every detail in that video might be true, it is true that the magnetic pole is shifting. You can use this step together with the last one by building your own toolbox of sources that you've confirmed are reliable. So I think we're running up against our time. Um, and I think we have at this point the time either to do the last exercise or to take questions. 
So I'm going to pause now to see if we have questions because we've covered all four of the steps. Um, so if you have questions, then let's let's handle them. Awesome. So you're welcome if you're here in the room to unmute or unmute your microphone and just speak up. And for anyone who's joining us on YouTube, you're welcome to type your, your questions into the YouTube chat and we can bring them over. Um, I know I had one comment come here through that was just, they were surprised at how, um, how savvy, you know, like the, the, these, the, they sent me a link to uh, natural news and vaccines and, and, and damaging and genocide. And, and it was just, it's so, it looks so real. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Sure that and and that's know. why, that's why we can't, you know, in, in a way you can't trust your gut, you can't believe your eyes you always have to do a little bit of research. And what I hope people take away from our session today is that it doesn't have to be a lot of research. That most of the time, any one of these steps is going to give you the answer. So we could easily find out very, very easily that natural news is not a reliable source. Uh, if we did any of the steps that I just uh, demonstrated, we'd see um, natural news is not a reliable source. And, uh, and then that's going to take us usually less than a minute, but it such, has such a huge impact because it tells us not to rely on anything. And in particular, it tells us not to share anything that we see there. And I think, I think COVID has been such a, and maybe vaccinations around COVID have been such a very good day-to-day -day example of how misinformation can spread so quickly and so easily um, on both sides, on all sides without anyone really um, wanting to spread disinformation, but still doing it by accident. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, we have a since oh, I'm going to do it again with a. Um, we have a special resource that we've developed since uh, this workshop was developed specifically about public health information. Uh, it's called CheckThenShare.ca, and it's got a lot of it's got its own custom search engine that searches public health authorities uh, around the world to get good information. And it also has some advice on how you respond to misinformation and disinformation when you see it, because that's something we haven't covered today. Um, and sometimes you don't want to, sometimes you, you're gonna be more concerned about not helping it spread, but a lot of the time it is really valuable to push back when you see something that you know is inaccurate, especially when it's about something really important like public health. Mm -hmm. Now, I think we're gonna run out of time for the exercise. So I'm gonna ask or one last question because um, we got some shy audience participators, but if there was one thing you would recommend, like these students either tell their parents or, or tell themselves <laughs> before they hit share on TikTok or Snapchat or Instagram <laughs> or Facebook, what, what is that thing? I know we've been talking about talking about time. What is the one, one key thing they can take away from today? I think the most important thing to take away is that we are not just consumers of information, we are broadcasters too. We have an impact. Um, whether we share something and also even if we choose not to respond when we see information, uh, all of that has an impact on people around us. There's been research that's shown that uh, in other pandemics, in past pandemics, that uh, just a 10% difference in the ratio between good information and bad information has a huge impact on how the, how the uh, pandemic actually spreads. So we have to remember that we are not just consumers. We have to remember we have a responsibility, but we also have power. We have power to make our information world. We have the power to make the internet and the world that we live in better with these really simple four steps that most of the time are going to take you 30 seconds to do. Amazing. I, I couldn't summarize it better myself. Thank you, Matthew, so much for joining us this morning. Uh, there's been a lots of thanks coming through the, the chat as well. 
Um, I want to thank all of our sites for joining us from across Alberta, the United States, South America, Europe. It's been wonderful having you, everyone who joined us on live, uh, live on YouTube. Thank you for, for joining us today. If you have any questions, we've, we've, this will be archived on YouTube. So if you want to go back to see some of those links and you want to run this again as, as like a little test to see how your students will do, or your friends or your parents, put your parents to the test. If they're showing sharing funky things on the Facebook like old people do, let them know that they can see if what they're sharing is actually true because we want to make sure that we're accountable for all of our communities. So thank you everyone for joining today. It's been wonderful having you and we'll see you again soon. Now, if you're looking for in particular a nice event, this Friday we will be doing a Halloween themed event with the Canadian Wildlife Federation on creepy crawlies and uh, uh, animal conservation. So we wonder to have you back. Otherwise, we will see you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Matthew. And your cat. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye, Andy. Have okay. a wonderful day. Bye. Bye, Michelle.